If you've seen number 106 of our Tank Chat series, curator David Willey talks about this vehicle. It's the German World War II Panzer IV. Uh, what I'd like to do now is build on that. And specifically, I'd like to get inside the tank uh, and give you an idea of what it'd be like to be a Panzer crewman in one of these vehicles in combat. In Tank Chats Reloaded, we'll be revisiting old favourites from the Tank Chat series and taking a new look at these fighting machines. Please remember to like, subscribe or click the little notification bell if you don't want to miss out on these videos. And I'd just like to say thank you to all our patrons for making this possible. Please join them if you can. There are three reasons for choosing this particular tank. First is this is the most numerous uh, German tank of World War II. Over eight and a half thousand were built. The second is this is quite an unusual vehicle. It's a pre-war design, but it's still in frontline service in 1945. There aren't many you can say that about. And the third reason, which is not obvious from where I'm standing, is that the interior of this vehicle is very, very well preserved. Now, that is rare. Most tanks, they can look good on the outside, but internally, they're a mess. There's been corrosion, they've been stripped out. This vehicle has original paintwork, it's got stenciling on the stores, boxes, it's got most of its original fittings. It really does give you an impression of what it'd be like to be inside the vehicle in combat. First, a recap, a bit of background. Um, now, as I said, this vehicle was in service throughout the whole of World War II, but it doesn't actually stay the same. This is an Asferung D. So this is a mid-production vehicle. But the early Panzer IVs didn't really look like this. Um, odd as it may seem when you think about some of the super heavies of the late war, things like the Tiger, even the Tiger itself. In 1939, this is regarded as a heavy breakthrough tank. And it had a different gun. Uh, initially, it was fitted with a short barrel, 75mm gun, uh, what we call a bunker buster. But tanks get bigger, tanks get better, and the poor old Panzer IV is relegated to the role of a medium tank. It needs to be able to fight other tanks, so it is up-gunned, and it's fitted with a long barrel, high velocity, 75. Uh, so if it comes across something like a Russian T-34, it's got the capability to deal with it. The other big change is that this vehicle has been fairly massively up-armoured. Now what's happening here is as the war goes on, tanks get bigger, tanks get better, and especially tank guns become more powerful, more destructive. So tanks need additional protection. Um, and this vehicle has got it in spades. Uh, to begin with, this area, this is what we call the glassy. Now, if you're in combat with another tank, um, the chances are you're going to be facing one another. So any nastiness is going to come in just here. And you can see with this, there are multiple layers of extra armor that have been added to the glassy plate. Because this, the angle there, that is a big old shot trap, anything coming from the front. The other area where it's really obvious is the space armor that's been fitted around the turret. Now, that's still present. There would have been extra spaced armor down the side. That's disappeared, I'm afraid. You can still see some of the fittings where it was attached. Um, these are called shirts and skirts. And what they were for initially is protection against Soviet anti-tank rifle rounds. But they're also jolly useful when it comes to um, weapons firing hollow point charges, things like the American bazooka. So you've got to imagine you've got extra spaced armor around the turret and the skirts actually down the side. Spaced armor, good protection, but there's an additional benefit. If you imagine the shirts are in place, the arm around the turret, from a distance, this vehicle in profile starts to resemble a tiger. Looking like a tiger on a World War II battlefield can never be a bad thing because Allied tank crews are going to find you much more intimidating. So, um, on top of the tank, 
uh, just a quick lesson in tank geography. At the front of the vehicle, you've got the glassy, and then obviously the gun, the turret, and this bit, which we call the mantlet. Um, going to the rear, there is what tank crew called the bustle, and that's the big rear stowage bin at the back of the turret. And then you're down onto the rear decks where you have the louvered ventilators for the engine, which is underneath. Five crew, five hatches. Um, hatches for the driver and the whole machine gunner, they're there at the front uh, on the glassy. Uh, the whole machine gunner also doubles as the radio operator and the comms kit is down there in between those two. You've then got a hatch here uh, for, the, for the loader. And on the other side of the turret, gunner. These are quite difficult to use. Um, a young Panzer crewman would have no difficulty. I'm gonna use the last of the hatches. That is the commander's cupola. That's enough for the outside. Time to get inside. So here we are, inside the turret. And the first thing that strikes you about this is how unbelievably cramped it is. And this is effectively you know, an empty tank. You imagine five guys and a huge amount of kit in here. It's very, very tight indeed. The next thing to think about is it's not stationary. A lot of this is live metal. The gun will be uh, elevating and depressing. The turret will be traversing. Um, you've really got to have total awareness of all your bodily extremities all the time. If you've got a hand or a foot in the wrong place, it will get pulped or removed. So, uh, I'm sitting here in the commander's seat. Um, in front of me is the gun breech, and then this is the recoil cage, because obviously when the gun is fired, it's going to recoil quite a long way in. Um, and then over on my left-hand side here, this is the gunner's position. He has uh, a 2.5 magnification uh, optical gun sight. He's also got um, elevation and traverse uh, wheels for manual use. Now, most Panzer IVs had uh, power traverse, an electric motor to actually turn the turret. But the last production run, um, for one reason or another, um, they decided not to have those, and that made life very, very interesting for the crew. Because in combat, a turret it takes a long time to traverse, and that's the sort of thing that can actually get you killed. Over here, on the right-hand side, this is the loader's position. And there's a small seat, practically down at deck level, for him to sit in when he's uh, not otherwise engaged. And then uh, there are the ready racks. Those are the rounds for immediate use. And there's more ammunition storage up front uh, between us and uh, where the driver's sitting. Now, the Panzer IV saw service really wherever uh, the Wehrmacht went during World War II. So vehicles like this would have been in the west, everywhere from the western desert through to uh, the eastern front. In the desert, this is a big metal box. It would be like sitting in an oven. Uh, you see pictures of Panzer crew, you know, for the camera, frying eggs on the metal of the tank. That's how hot it got. And the other thing about the desert is the actual weather conditions. I mean, apart from the heat, uh, you get these big sandstorms uh, called the Hamzin blow up. They could last for days. And if you venture away from your vehicle, in those sort of conditions, the chances are you're going to stumble off, get lost, and really just walk to a very unpleasant, solitary death. The other extreme would be somewhere like the Eastern Front. And, you know, minus 20 degrees, that'd be nothing. Uh, it could be minus 30, it could be minus 40. If you touch any piece of metal inside this vehicle with a bare hand, you're going to leave flesh behind and the crew are going to spend an enormous amount of time um, thawing the vehicle out, just keeping it serviceable with blow lamps and stoves, trying to stop everything freezing solid. Um, the conditions would have been absolutely horrific. Mm. 
moving on, we need to look at this thing we call situational awareness. And what that is all about is um, you know, knowing what's happening outside the tank. And it is very, very limited. The gunner over here, he can see where the gun is pointing. That's about it. Uh, for everybody else, there are vision blocks dotted around the vehicle, but it's like looking through a very, very narrow sort of letterbox slit. Um, so the only guy who's actually got 360 degree vision is the commander, and he is the only one with all round situational awareness. He has a cupola and it's got vision blocks inserted all the way around. So he has got 360 degree vision. Um, but it's still, it's, it's still fairly limited. If he wants to get a better view, have a better idea of the terrain, what's happening outside, he's actually got to stick his head out of the turret or stand on his seat and he's exposing himself and in combat that is obviously extremely risky. And then you've got the two other crew positions um, which I, to be honest, I can't see from here, uh, but down on that side in front of the gunner there is the driver in his position and then over on the other side uh, there is the hull machine gunner who also doubles as a radio operator. And down in his position, he's got the weapon mount for the MG34 um, and the comms kit, um, which has unfortunately in this vehicle long gone. So I have made my way down to the forward section of the fighting compartment, and I am sitting in the driver's seat. Once again, you can see how very original the condition of this vehicle is. This cream colored paint uh, was put on at the time. Uh, there is stenciling, I'm just looking behind me here, uh, Zwei glass blocker, that's a storage uh, bin for two vision blocks. Um, it is really very much as it would have been. And here, there is something which is actually very special. Now we don't know much about this vehicle, to be honest. Um, it was acquired by the British Army at the end of the war from a driver training school. Um, but what we do have here is a little bit of original soldier graffiti. And there are two human heads. There's one here um, that actually bears a, a fairly startling resemblance to Herr Hitler. And just here, there is a female head. Um, seeing this, seeing original World War II graffiti in a vehicle like this is a you know, we don't encounter this very often. It's not often preserved. It's a real privilege to see it. So that's the Tank Museum's Panzer IV. Uh, it's a great privilege to be able to get inside a vehicle that well preserved. But, you know, as a tank enthusiast, try and imagine the conditions in that vehicle in combat and try and imagine the experience of the men who fought and sometimes died inside these tanks during World War II.